Resting quietly in the Ozark Mountains is a nearly 200-year-old grist mill that serves as a silent monument for the rural town of Fair Grove. I'm Jim V. Brock. I've spent the last 30 years documenting, photographing, and now videoing the stories and history of Old Water Mills. This is Womack Mill. Let's have a look around. The Womack Mill is the town's oldest standing structure, and it was built in 1883. It was known as the Bogle and Hines Mill, named after Messrs. Joseph Hine and John Bogle. The mill was operated as a wheat mill up until about 1926, and from there it switched over to corn. Inside here we have a beautiful stone mill and a pair of roller mills. We're going to take a look at all of that as we look around Womack Mill. Now, Clifford Womack and his wife operated the mill up until about 1969. From there, it sat empty for about 10 years, and in 1977, the Fairgrove Historical Society bought the mill and began restoration. And in November of 1986, the mill was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. Okay, so it's 4 o'clock in the morning. What's the first thing the millwright's going to do? Well, he's going to probably be uh, in here with uh, lanterns, first of all, so he could see what he's doing at that time in the morning. And um, probably what the, uh, two guys would probably do when they first get here is fire up this boiler. It takes a while to build up steam, as they say. Well, that's, that's true. It does. And they would load this firebox down here with whatever kind of wood they can get that's available at the time and build a fire down here and fill it up to a certain amount where it allows for the steam to build and it goes through this piping network here which is probably a little different back then than it is now um, they were pretty much running this thing by sight sound smell mm -hmm. and uh, but anyway then they would pipe this uh, steam over to the steam engine the mill is powered by a single-cylinder Southern Engine Company steam engine. Machines like this require a lot of maintenance while running. At the time of this video, the boiler and the engine was down for routine maintenance in preparation for the annual Ozarks Heritage Reunion, which is held the last weekend in September. It's, it's interesting to see all the spare parts that you have here because it's not like you went online and ordered a <laughs> mill kit from an Amazon brought it the next day. I mean, yeah. you know, think about not only the time to, to build the mill, just the, the handmade lumber pieces mm -hmm. and the beautiful masonry that's in this mm -hmm. mill. Um, you, you had to search around and find the pulleys, find the line shaft. You had to order the stones probably from France. And just think, it probably took a year or longer just to get the mill stones ordered in here. And the guy who put this together, or fellows that put this together, probably only had like an eighth grade education, and they had to engineer all of these line pulleys and, and figure out the, the ratios you were talking about and make this whole thing work. It's just mm -hmm. amazing. And, and you know, the, the Fairgrove Historical Society is interested in all the history of the community, but its focal point is the mail. Towards the end of the summer, when the crop was ready to harvest, they would hand harvest this crop, and then they would have to hand shuck the corn as well. Now, depending on whether or not they had a sheller at home, they may already shell the corn and bring the shelled kernels to the mill. But they didn't have to. They could have brought the entire cob with the kernels still on it to the mill. The first thing they would have done is back up the wagon to this dock right here, and then there's actually a chute over here in the floor where they may have put those ears of corn down that chute and ran them through a sheller there. From there, they would have been elevated up probably to the second floor and ran through a seed separator and a cleaner of some kind. This would have taken the shaft out of the 
out of the corn kernels and cleaned the corn kernels so that they were ready to go and be ground. You wanted those kernels as clean as possible before they ground them. From there, they would fall down a chute into one of the hoppers on one of the different types of grinders in here. Now, they have several grinders on display in this mill, which is really cool to look at. They have an old vertical stone mill here. They have a horizontal stone mill here, and they have two roller mills here. Another mill they could have had would have been a burr mill, which uses steel plates. So let's talk about the different types of mills that, that, that are inside this building. There are two types of stone mills here in Womack Mill. So let's talk about the smaller one first. This is a vertical stone mill. The principle between the two is exactly the same, but I'll spend more time over there. Um, very simply, the grain falls in the hopper. The mechanism shakes, lines it up, goes in between the two stones. In both cases, there's a, a stationary stone and a running stone. In this case, they're vertical. So this is a smaller of the two machines, but it's still just as efficient. This one's probably just a little bit older. One of the things that I really love about these old mills is looking at the different types of grinders that they used over the years. We talked about the vertical stone mill over there. This is a horizontal stone mill, and these are really cool because they're huge. This one's about a 42 inch stone. It's going to have two stones in it that run opposing to each other. The bed stone, which is set down in the floor, and the running stone, which sits up in, up in the housing. This housing is called a vat, and what would happen is the corn would go into the hopper either manually or through a chute. The, the shaker mechanism shakes it all down, lines it up so that it goes into the center of the stones. From that, there are lines or grooves inside those stones and they work against each other. That pulverizes the corn or wheat down to whatever consistency that you have the stones set for. Now, an interesting little fact is if you have the so stones set too close together, the cornmeal or wheat germ will come out with a burnt smell. And so you would constantly see the miller checking that meal to come out of there and he would smell it. And if it had a burnt smell to it, then he knew his stones were rubbing against each other and he needed to back them off just a little bit. This is where the phrase, keep your nose to the grindstone comes from. Interesting little fact. Another little fact that you might find interesting is the furniture housing around the stones was the center point of federal legislation because as you can tell this beautiful piece of furniture covers those stones you can't see how big the stones are inside this furniture piece so you could have the vat set for a 42 inch stone but the actual stones inside may only be a 30 or 32 inch stone what would happen with that is you could have up to 200 pounds of flour or cornmeal stuck between the stones and the vat in that case when you were done grinding, the farmer would have paid you and left, and you would have had four or five bags of material still left in here to, uh, to take and process and sell. So federal legislation had to be done to dictate the distance between the edge of the stone and the inside of the vat. These are really cool. The bedstone is stationary. The running stone is the one that turns. This is powered by a pulley that's down in the basement. Um, these are very heavy. These will weigh, a 42 inch stone will weigh over a ton each half. And it takes a special crane, which there's two sitting here in Womack Mill, to lift them up. They are very heavy and they're, they have to be redressed from time to time and that's called dressing the stone. These are really cool. So the stone mills that we talked about a minute ago were back as far as back as the 1700s overseas and they arrived in the United States in the early 1800s, late 1700s thereabout. And they used those for up to about 100 years. But about the time the 1900s came about, the roller mills started to show up in these mills. These are really cool. They're very, very heavy, but they're a little more efficient than the stone mills. What would happen here, there are two steel drums inside here, at least two steel drums inside here, and they work opposing each other. The material falls in the top and it is literally crushed through those, uh, those different uh, rollers inside there. These are magical to watch because all of these wheels are spinning and turning and they're going in opposite directions and the belts are going everywhere else. These are really amazing. These were slightly more efficient than the stone mills were. They just came about a little bit later in history. If you get into a more modern mill, you'll start to see burr mills start to show up, and those are where two steel plates ground against each other. All three of these different styles end up with the same type of product. They were just came about in different points of history.
One of the ways the millwright would have made money is by grinding the corn directly for the farmer. In this case, the farmer would have to pay for those services rendered, and that was great. But there was another way that was beneficial for both the millwright and the farmer. The farmer and the millwright sometimes would share in the crop. This way, the farmer could get his product milled and taken home, and the millwright would then have product to sell to some of the town folk as well. When the mill was doing really well, so did the town. When the mill faltered, the town faltered too. Now, Walmick Mill was operated off a steam engine, so one of the major things that plagued these old mills is eliminated, and that would be the flooding events that took place of these mills sitting next to a water feature of some kind. But they were still lost due to fire, and that's because these mills were using a material inside that is highly explosive. You may not realize it, but both corn and wheat in their dry state is highly flammable. So inside this mill, as you're grinding the corn, there is dust in the air, and it only takes a spark of some kind, and poof, the entire building is on fire. And this was the end of a lot of these great mills. Life in the 1800s was hard and primitive. It was not uncommon for entire families to live in a small one-room log cabin hand-built from the trees right on the property. The life of the rural millwright was that of long hours and hard labor, and the reward was knowing the mill was the heartbeat of the community. I'm Jim V. Brock. I hope you've enjoyed our tour of Womack Mill. Let's find another mill to explore. Ooh.